This episode is brought to you by Marvel Studios Echo. All episodes streaming January 9th, only on Hulu and Disney+. Plus. Rated TVMALV. Viewer discretion advised. Maya Lopez has betrayed her mentor, the notorious Kingpin. Now on the run, she returns to her hometown to prepare for the biggest fight of her life. Don't miss Marvel Studios' hardest-hitting series yet. An epic five-episode event. Marvel Studios Echo. All episodes streaming January 9th, only on Hulu and Disney+. Plus. Hello, and welcome to Scary to Sleep. I'm your host, Shelby Scott. I just wanted to say thank you to all of you on Twitter who have been spreading the word about the show. I noticed a major upswing in being tagged and mentioned on Twitter this week, and a couple of you even told Cher herself to come listen to the show, which was really cool. Um, One of those people being Tara of the Three Spooked Girls podcast, which if you are not already subscribed to, I highly recommend adding them to your playlist right away. A quick reminder to send in those kids stories for our special kids Halloween episode. Also teen stories as well. I already have a few teen submissions, but I would love a few more. I am still in need of lots of kids stories. So if you're looking for a reason for less screen time for the little ones, have them write a scary story for their old pal Shelby. This week is pretty jam-packed with scares, as you could probably see from the duration time on your podcast player. So let's get started. First up is a story you'll need to do a little homework for. If you haven't listened to episode 62, To Say Goodbye, and the second story, It's Nice to Have a Hobby, please go back and listen right now because coming right up is part two and the finale, which went together so seamlessly, I just read them all together. Seriously, it's so seamless, I bet you'll never be able to tell where part two ends and part three begins. Unless, however, you've been keeping up with the author, Reddit user TacoCat0927, and you've already read ahead. In fact, go give TacoCat some love, by the way. Tell them how much you love the series, because I had several emails and comments from you guys making sure I didn't forget to read the sequels. Enough rambling. Here is the much-anticipated finale of... It's nice to have a hobby. Patrick! Patrick! I screeched my husband's name up the staircase to the living room. Get your ass down here! I heard the staccato stampede of my husband racing through the house and glanced over my shoulder to see him skid around the corner in panic. What the hell? What's going on? What did I do? It's not what you did. It's what they did. I told him, motioning towards the shelves that housed my portrait collection. I saw the confusion on his face and knew that a lengthier explanation was in order. But I figured words would not be as efficient, so I grabbed my husband by the shoulders and led him over to the portrait of Montgomery Radcliffe. Pushing his face down until his nose was nearly pressed against the smooth glass frame. I made a simple statement to my husband. Notice anybody familiar? Patrick squinted his eyes and scrutinized the photo for a couple of minutes. I was nervously cracking my knuckles, waiting for his reaction. When too much time passed for my liking, I huffed in frustration. Well? I I mean, Mr. Radcliffe is looking rather dapper today, but he hasn't changed since yesterday. Look, I know you're upset that you're losing to me by five points, but to try and cheat me? Honey, that's low. Patrick said as he turned to give me a wily grin. Huh? I quickly pushed him out of the way in order to take another look at the portrait. In front of me stood Mr. Radcliffe, perfectly polished with nary a stray hair nor stained garment. Also absent was the puddle of liquid at his feet, and more importantly, the body of Mr. Gunderson. But he was right here. I stammered, pointing to the spot in the photograph where Mr. Gunderson's battered and beaten body had been. Who? asked Patrick. 
Mr. Gunderson. I saw him in the picture. Uh, he looked like he had... He got the shit kicked out of him. Mr. Radcliffe, he... He... He looked like he was... Uh, well, uh... He looked like he was responsible for it. I sputtered, having difficulty fully articulating exactly what I presumed had happened. <sighs> Come on, hun. Patrick said sadly, leading me by the elbow towards the stairs. I think you've had a rough month and it's starting to affect your mental health. Really, dude? We've been living with these photographs of morphing dead people for over two years, and now is when you decide I'm crazy? I saw him, Patrick. I saw Mr. Gunderson in that photo, and he didn't look alive. Now he's nowhere to be seen? Here in this world, nor in that photo? You can't tell me. That's just a mere coincidence. Patrick gave me another one of his famous exaggerated sighs and raised his hands in defeat. <sighs> okay, I'll bite. Let's say what you saw is true. What do we do? The cop told us there was no sign of forced entry into his house, nor signs of a struggle. If old Monty over there actually did kidnap and murder our neighbor, wouldn't there have been evidence? Not if he dragged Mr. Gutterson into the photo first, I hypothesized. There was knocked over furniture and pools of what I assumed to be blood on the ground when I last looked at the picture. He must have been beaten after entering the photo. Well, if that's the case, then where's the body now? It's clearly no longer in the photo. I studied the photograph of Montgomery Radcliffe one more time before responding. L look, he's leaning on that old barrel, same as he was yesterday. But the barrel itself has been moved. I pointed to where the writing on the outside of the barrel, which was fully centered yesterday, was now skewed to the left. So, let me get this straight. You think Mr. Radcliffe left this frame, went over to our neighbors, kidnapped him, brought him into this photo beat him to death and then hid the body in the barrel he's currently propped up against I know it sounds ridiculous but what other explanation is there uh, how about Mr. Gunderson being on an extended vacation or on the lam from the law or ran off with some random woman or he shut up I get it I snapped at Patrick, cutting off his annoying ramblings. Fine, maybe I'm crazy, but I know what I saw. I walked back upstairs with my arms crossed in defiance and headed towards the bedroom. I turned and raised one eyebrow at my doubting husband. If I'm right, though, then I guess you better not do anything to piss me off or else you'll be answering to them. I gave him a devilishly sly smile as he rolled his eyes at me and mumbled. They don't scare me. But as I started to turn back around, I noticed my husband glance apprehensively at the stairs to the basement and give me a nervous gulp. A couple months passed in relative normalcy, and soon the incident with Mr. Gunderson and our photogenic friends were pushed to the back of our minds. I had managed to convince myself that perhaps I was just imagining things and the stress of losing Doug had indeed taken a toll on my mental well-being. I was prepping dinner in the kitchen when Patrick came home from work slamming the door furiously as he trudged into the room yelling, That son of a bitch is framing me! Huh? I said, looking up from the bowl of mashed potatoes I was seasoning. Gary, at work, 
he told Mr. Carson that I was the one who messed up the numbers on the Delmer account. That crafty asshole used my computer after work hours to make it look like I was the one who made the mistake. I'm in deep shit. I could be fired. They're taking sides with that liar ass Gary. What? But you're the one who landed that account. You're the one busting your ass and working late to make sure everything is ready and on time. How did this happen? I was getting overwhelmed. And gave Gary access to the account passwords to help me crunch some numbers. And he totally fucked me over. He's been after my position for years. I guess I never thought he would pull some sketchy shit to get it. Patrick slumped down into one of the kitchen chairs and put his face in his hands. I'm so fucking screwed. I walked over and gently placed a hand on his shoulder. We'll get through this. I'm sure your boss will understand if you explain things to him. Not unless Gary confesses, or I can manage to find some proof to back me up. I opened my mouth to reply, but quickly closed it when I realized he was right. It was Gary's word against my husband, and the evidence was pretty damning. I tried to lighten the situation and said, with a slight smirk, <laughs> Why don't you ask our friends in the basement for help? Patrick looked up from the table and gave me a piercing stare, indicating he did not find my comment very amusing. Oh, you're so funny. Plus, having a hypothetical ghost photo murder Gary isn't going to solve anything. Without a confession, I'm screwed. It couldn't hurt to ask them, I joked. Again, trying to de-escalate the growing tension in the room with humor. I immediately regretted my joke as my husband stood up abruptly and started walking towards the bedroom. I thought about going after him and apologizing, but realized he probably needed some alone time to work out his frustrations. I went back to prepping dinner and ate solo at the dining table, deep in thought about our current predicament. I awoke around one in the morning to use the bathroom and noticed my husband wasn't in the bed beside me. Curious, I donned my robe and walked out into the living room. I saw a faint light glowing from the basement and tiptoed quietly down the stairs to investigate. I could hear the familiar voice of my husband whispering to the portraits on the shelf. kill him. That's a little harsh. I just want him scared enough to make a confession. If you guys really are what my wife thinks you are, can you help a brother out? I stifled a giggle while I watched my husband pour his heart out to a shelf of framed photographs. I silently made my way back up to bed so Patrick wouldn't discover me spying on him. As I sat in bed, Trying to drift back off to sleep, a feeling of unease started to wash over me. Were those photos capable of hearing us? I mean, obviously they knew I was distressed over Doug's death, but resorting to straight-up murder as retaliation seemed a bit extreme to me. Mr. Gunderson was a douchebag, sure, but he didn't deserve to die. I rolled over and closed my eyes hoping that tomorrow would be uneventful. He didn't show up to work today, Patrick said nervously, setting his laptop bag down on the couch. Who? I asked. Gary. I looked up at Patrick in a panic and we both seemed to have the exact same thought as our eyes drifted to the entrance to the basement. You don't think, I mean, I heard you last night, 
There's no way. I stumbled over the words as I started to stand up. We both made our way to the top of the basement steps and glanced fretfully at each other before starting our descent. I made it to the first shelf and started quickly scanning all the frames containing adult males. Well, I don't see him in Monty's photo, nor is he in Sir Huckleberry's, Reginald Dexter's, or Mr. Pumpernickel's. Check the women. Some of them look strong enough to potentially take on a full-grown man. I called to my husband as he started furiously perusing the shelf containing the women. Lady Clover, Sarah Margaret, Mary Elizabeth, Princess Isabella, and the Duchess of Astridge are all clear, he replied. It couldn't have been. I trailed off as my gaze shifted to the shelf of child portraits. I quickly examined the photos of the children and was just starting to relax when I reached the last frame. All the color drained from my face as I gazed upon the image. Adorable little Agatha lay peacefully in her crib, a slight sneer adorning her cherub-like face. And behind her hung Patrick's co-worker Gary, dangling from the chandelier, eyes bulging, a look of pure terror etched across his face. Patrick sat in the corner of the basement, knees pulled to his chest, arms around his legs, rocking back and forth and muttering, holy shit, holy shit, what the hell are we going to do? I mean, one unsolved disappearance is suspicious enough, but to have another one linked to us is a whole other story, I said in a panic. We have to get rid of the evidence. I walked back over to the portrait of Agatha, preparing to open the frame and remove the picture. A small gasp escaped my lips. <sighs> um, sweetie, he's not there anymore. Patrick leaped from the ground in a surprising show of agility and dashed over to where I stood. Sure enough, Little Agatha was once again alone in her frame. Gone was the smirk on her face, and gone was the hanging body of Gary. Where did she stash him? My husband asked, his eyes darting furiously over the picture. I have no idea. There's literally no furniture or containers that would hold a grown man. We need an alibi. Something, something to clear us of any involvement, Patrick stated. <gasps> Honestly, we weren't exactly involved, and there is no proof that we were the ones to take Gary. The police would have to find fingerprints or something at his house, and since we weren't even there, they won't. We went to dinner at Mario's last night, and Rebecca, the neighbor, saw us come home last night around 11. So there's some form of alibi... My statement seemed to calm Patrick down a bit, and I saw the tension in his shoulder relax slightly. He ran a hand through his thinning hair and replied, Yeah, I mean, you're right and all, but I specifically asked them not to kill him. Do you understand what this means? We can't even have a minor dispute with somebody without fear that these photos are going to retaliate with murder. The gravity of the situation hit me like a punch to the gut. Patrick was right. We would essentially be living in fear for the lives of everybody we came in contact with, and avoiding any forms of conflict was pretty much impossible. Suddenly, I had a flashback to me teasing my husband the night I discovered Mr. Gunderson. 
What if Patrick and I had a fight? Would those portraits come after me or my husband? I decided the best course of action, as cliche as it sounded, was to go to bed and get a good night's sleep and think upon our situation in the morning. At least tomorrow was Saturday, and we would have the weekend to devise a game plan. Incoming phone call. Patrick's phone phone vibrated on the table as his obnoxious ringtone blared at full volume. Uh, Seriously? Don't people sleep in on Saturdays? He grumbled while his hand fumbled for the phone on his nightstand. Hello, this is Patrick. He croaked into the phone. I watched my husband go from half asleep to wide awake and upright at attention in the blink of an eye. Yes, Mr. Carson, I, yes, I understand. Yes, I'll be right there. I turned one eyebrow up at my husband in confusion, and then my expression turned to one of dread. Why was Patrick's boss calling on a Saturday? This could not be good news. He's in his office. He won't talk to anybody but me, Patrick said cryptically. Mr. Carson, what does he want? No, not Mr. Carson. It's Gary who wants to talk to me. A tsunami of varying emotions cascaded into my brain. Relief, fear, and confusion fought for dominancy, and eventually confusion won the battle. I don't understand. He's alive? I asked. Apparently so. Mr. Carson says he's locked himself in his office and is demanding to speak to me and me only. Mr. Carson said that Gary seemed unhinged, and he called the cops. Gary won't even let the cops in. He keeps threatening to kill himself if anybody but me enters the room. This this cannot be good, I mused. I'm coming with you. I have to know what's going on. Okay, uh, get dressed and uh, let's go. The car ride to Patrick's office was filled with tense silence. Patrick focused intently on operating the vehicle, and I sat in the passenger seat, nervously picking at my cuticles. When we parked at the office complex, both of us hesitated when reaching for the door handle. I wasn't sure what to expect when the elevator door opened at the seventh floor, but what greeted me was the normal office floor filled with claustrophobic cubicles and uncomfortable silence. This way, Patrick said as he put his hand on my back to lead me in the direction of Gary's office. When we rounded the corner, I saw the familiar face of Mr. Carson, along with five uniformed police officers surrounding the door to what I could only assume was Gary's office. I got here as soon as I could. Patrick remarked to his boss. What the hell is going on? Gary must have broken into the office sometime last night. I was alerted by security that some lunatic was roaming our floor mumbling to himself, Mr. Carson explained. When I got here, I noticed Gary pacing back and forth, looking like absolute hell. When he saw me, he just screamed, No, not you, and bolted into his office and locked the door. Mr. Carson went on to explain that whenever he went to unlock the door, Gary threatened that he had a gun and would blow his brains out if anybody opened the door other than Patrick. Mr. Carson then called the cops in case the situation escalated out of control. Did he say why he wanted to talk to me only? Patrick asked Mr. Carson. No, but when I first got here, I could hear him muttering something about ghost babies and ropes. Patrick and I glanced quickly at each other, eyes as wide as saucers. 
Patrick swallowed an uncomfortably large lump in his throat and took a step towards the closed door. I could faintly hear Gary rustling around inside and muttering to himself. Patrick gently knocked on the door and quietly said, Gary, it's me, Patrick. Can we talk? The rustling in the room grew louder, and I could hear the pounding of Gary's footsteps as he approached the door. You set that freak after me with that fucking baby demon thing. You're fucking responsible, I just know it. Gary screeched behind the closed door. Patrick decided to deploy the tactic of ignorance. Gary, I have no idea what you're talking about. Are you okay, man? Do you need me to call an ambulance or something? You're not making any sense, and we're getting kind of concerned out here. Liar! Gary screamed. Gary trailed off and was silent for a second. Patrick took the opportunity to goad Gary on, to get him to keep talking about the incident. Gary, are you saying that a floating ghost baby threatened to harm you unless you stopped messing with me? (laughs) You know how ridiculous that sounds. Why don't you open the door and come out? We'll get you to a hospital. Make sure you're alright, okay? I'm not fucking insane, and I I know what I fucking saw. You exist. You're so fucking perfect. Just let me have any of your precious accounts. But I showed you. I showed you that I'm smarter than you. I could have landed that Delmar account if you had just given me the chance. But no. No. You just had to hog all the glory. So I took what should have been mine in the first place. Patrick and Mr. Carson exchanged inquisitive glances. You could see the cogs turning inside Mr. Carson's head and the light that came into his eyes the minute he comprehended what had transpired. Suddenly, the door flung open, and there stood Gary. His eyes were bloodshot, with thick bags hanging underneath. His clothes were the same as he was wearing when I saw him dangling in the portrait, torn untucked and smudged with dirt and grime. Along his neck, you could see the purplish bruised outline of where the rope had encircled. The police immediately converged on Gary, pinning his arms behind his back and forcing him to the ground. I'm afraid I'm going to have to fire you, Gary, but I dare say that's the least of your problems. You need help, and these nice officers are going to take you somewhere where you can get some treatment, Mr. Carson told him as the officers began to drag Gary towards the elevator. Gary bucked and kicked against the officers as he shrieked. I'm gonna fucking kill you, Patrick. Your fucking little ghost baby won't see. I smiled inwardly wanting so badly to tell Gary that if little Agatha couldn't save us, I had a whole backup ghost army at my disposal. Mr. Carson turned to Patrick to apologize and assure him that his position at the company was secure. He even suggested that Patrick take a week-long paid vacation for all the disruption that Gary had caused. 
I gripped Patrick's hand tightly, and we smiled a knowing smile at each other before heading out of the building towards home. Patrick and I are growing accustomed to having a literal squad of ghosts at our disposal, but we are always careful to clarify with them when somebody wrongs us. After all, we don't need everybody to be murdered or tortured. Sometimes a nice vacation into a dead person's portrait is enough persuasion for one to change their ways. We adore our little group, and we continue to tend to them lovingly, and in return, they provide us with entertainment, and more importantly, comfort. If you want to stop by and admire our wonderful framed friends, please feel free. They love visitors. Oh, and don't worry if you see some extra barrels in Montgomery Radcliffe's picture. It's his new hobby, and he just loves adding to his collection. Well, I hope I never cut off that lady in traffic. Let's take a break. As many Scary to Sleep fans know, I've been going through a lot of changes in my life, and one thing I've been doing is getting my finances much more organized, and that includes paring down some of the subscriptions I pay for. It feels like everything is a subscription these days, be it for the gym or streaming services or music, the list goes on and on, and something that has helped me tremendously is rocket money. They not only helped me cancel subscriptions that were a pain to try to do myself. Have you ever tried to deal with some of these companies directly? It's just a headache. Rocket Money also alerts me when the subscriptions I did keep go up in price, giving me the ability to weigh my options and keep those little extras that add up oh so quickly in check. Rocket Money is a personal finance app that finds and cancels your unwanted subscriptions, monitors your spending, and helps lower your bills. I can see all of my subscriptions in one place, and if I see something I don't want, I can cancel it with a tap. I never have to get on the phone with customer service. Rocket Money has over 5 million users and has helped save its members an average of $720 a year with over 500 million in canceled subscriptions. Stop wasting money on things you don't use. Cancel your unwanted subscriptions by going to rocketmoney.com slash scare you to sleep. That's rocketmoney.com slash scare you to sleep. Rocketmoney.com slash scare you to sleep. Our last story of the night is by a new author to the show. This story was so unique that I really hope to hear more from him in the future. I hope you have a strong stomach because Alex Kelso has super brought it this week. Please enjoy Good Harvest. I found myself traveling through the dark, mountainous confines of western Pennsylvania on a business trip for the Kevin Prudeau Real Estate Agency of Philadelphia. Whether by misfortune or malice, it was I who was selected by my superiors to undertake the assessments of a number of properties in the small town of Carlsberg. Why the property owners had selected our agency, which though prestigious and well-respected by the citizens of the greater Philadelphia metropolitan area, was beyond me, as we were a five-hour drive from Carlsberg and western Pennsylvania as a whole. The misty mountains and dense forests carved their way through most of central and western Pennsylvania, served to delineate the line between civilization and the still untamed wilds of the state. As I drove my beige rental car along the endless highways, I saw the landscape turn from the low, green, lush farmlands of Lancaster and York to the dark, towering skyscape of evergreens and the bare, dark gray bark of maples and elms, whose shadowy lattice of branches was broken only by the indigo and black of the ever-looming mountains. As I made my way into the heart of the state, the roads grew less and less crowded, and I often found myself the lone solitary traveler on the highway, 
my high beams shining off into the darkness. It was finally after five long hours of travel, I finally arrived on the outskirts of Carlsberg. The approach to Carlsberg is a series of farmlands, or rather what used to be farmlands. The fields along the high post road on the approach had not seen neither a planting nor harvest in some time. Off in the distance I could make out through the gloom the outlines of silos and barns, decrepit and rotting. Only a dim glow from the dusty windows gave any sign that these farms were still inhabited. Driving on, I soon saw the lights of the town, forcing their way through the fog which had plagued me for hours, and my heart rose as the prospect of a hot meal and a warm bed seemed all the nearer. I realized as my battered beige rental car entered the town just how small Carlsberg was. The glows I had mistaken for streetlights were in reality the result of a few buildings in the town clumped so tightly together that it gave the illusion of lighted thoroughfares. The town's one true road was scarcely wide enough for two vehicles to pass, and even then only the narrowest of cars would be able to pass without scraping each other. A number of side streets and alleys branched off what I would later learn was called Main Street in an unsurprising lack of creativity, but these were unpaved footpaths and my car had no hope of fitting down any of them. The town proper seemed comprised only of the things seemingly necessary for a town to exist. With a crumbling theater and a small diner, it's only luxuries. It was at this time I wished that my employers had given me more information on Carlsberg. All I knew was that I had a reservation at the Wyndham Hotel in town and that I was meeting with a client, a Mr. George Von Holden, the scion of a local farming family, the next day at 11 o'clock sharp at his farm. Before anything else, though, I needed to find the hotel. I was approaching the end of the short street when I saw it. It wasn't hard to miss, and I was surprised that I had not seen it before, as it was one of the three buildings in town to have more than three floors, the town hall and the theater being the other two. As I drove up, I saw a small, unpaved parking lot next to the hotel, and pulled into next to a row of ancient trucks. The Wyndham Hotel looked to be the newest building in Carlsberg, in that its facade was merely old, instead of ancient. It was built sometime likely near the end of the war. It looked like an imitation of the style of building popular some decades ago, based more on what someone thought was popular rather than what actually was. As a result, it possessed the columns and windows of the neoclassical and the overall shape of art deco. From outside appearances, it looked well kept, but I could not tell in the darkening gloom of the night. I exited my car, carrying my valise out with me, and my feet sunk perceptively into the soft mud of the parking lot. I had not up to this point appraised any building outside of a city, and for what would not be the last time during my time in Carlsberg, wished that I had brought a sturdy pair of boots with me. Lugging my heavy luggage out of the car's uncooperative trunk, I began to make my way across the muddy parking lot to the hotel Wyndham. As I entered the lobby, I saw that the title Hotel Wyndham was generous, and that while the facade had at least attempted to maintain the appearance of a hotel, the lobby had not. A stained and mildewing wooden floor had been haphazardly covered in disgusting, rotting carpets, and the flaking paint revealed walls covered in termite and boreholes from other burrowing insects. An electric chandelier hung precariously above the lobby, sending its weak, sickly yellow light across the deserted lobby. Worn, sagging armchairs and divans sat scattered around, and an untold number of previous visitors had worn the faded red cushions almost all the way through. Approaching the desk, my shoes made a 
dull, wet, thudding sound. The desk itself seemed to be in good enough shape, but as I got closer, I saw a thick layer of grime and dust on the top, with deep trails from things being hastily moved. Behind the desk were rows of keys on hooks, and an old battered door with a blackened bronze doorknob. An old yellowed guest book lay open on the desk, near to the service bell. It let out a tinny ring as I brought my hand down on it. I'm a coming, I'm a coming. I heard someone yell from behind the door. Its rust covered hinges squeaked loudly as it swung open but the sound was not nearly as unpleasant as the man who shuffled his way through it. His face and arms were sickly and pasty. His jowly face was covered in a thin stubble, the same salt and pepper color as the little remaining on his balding scalp. He had beady little eyes peering out from under a dark, heavy brow, which was itself covered in dry and flaking skin. Hello, I said, mustering the best smile I could. My name is Andrew Stevenson. I believe I have a reservation for three nights. I pulled my identification from my wallet and showed it to him, hoping to avoid him or the desktop touching it. (sighs) Yeah, yeah, I am Maria, he said. Please sign your name here, he said, jabbing down with a thick finger on the blank row of the guest book. (sighs) For your room number, just put 11. That's where you're going to be staying. He wheezed and took a deep, heavy breath. (sighs) Dates, too. While you're at it. Gotta have everything official-like these days. I did as he instructed, but as I bent over, I made sure to keep my eyes on him. He grabbed an ancient-looking key off the hook behind him. A beaten and scratched metal disc had the number 11 carved into it. I stood back up straight, and he held the key out to me. I managed to take a hold of it without touching his hand. Thank you, Mr... Bill's fine, he said through a throat full of phlegm. (coughs) Mr. Bill, if you like. I sure as hell don't care. He took another deep breath. (gasps) Right, so your room is on the second floor. Take a left at the top of the stairs. Another loud intake. (gasps) We got, we've got hot running water and if it looks a little brown just give it a second or two it'll it should clear right up extra towels sheets and the lack are extra local calls on the phone are free one more deep breath (laughs) please no loud music or shouting as to not disturb our other guests if you need anything just press one on the phone and i'll help you Thank you very much, Mr. Bill, I said, glad to finally be rid of the unpleasant man. I tucked the key into my pocket and, grabbing my bags, began to head up to the room. A rumbling in my stomach reminded me I hadn't eaten in some hours. I turned around to see Bill shuffling back through the door at his glacial pace. Excuse me, Mr. Bill, I called out. He turned, clearly unhappy about the extra movement. Is there a place I can get something to eat? Patties, he grumbled. Diner down the street. It's not as nice as what you got in Philadelphia, but it's cheap and hot. Thanks, I said, but he had already turned around and left the lobby without another word. The stairs squeaked as I climbed, the air growing cold and heavy. I pulled my coat around me tighter, not expecting it to be this cold indoors. There must have been some awful draft coming from above. I hoped my room had a working radiator at least. The hallway on the second floor was just as disgusting as the lobby. The same peeling paint covered the walls and the bare wooden floors creaked with every step. 
As I turned the corner, I saw a faded wooden door with 11 in flaking white paint at eye level. Unlocking the door, I stepped inside my room. I had braced myself, prepared for the worst. It was, however, far beyond anything I could have at the time possibly imagined. After I turned on the lights, I soon regretted being able to see the room. The ignorance of darkness would have been preferable to what I saw. No sooner had the lights gone on than an untold number of cockroaches could be seen scurrying underneath the various pieces of furniture set about the room. There was an old, worn wardrobe set back against the wall next to the windows. I resolved then and there that my clothes would remain in my luggage for the duration of my stay, no matter how wrinkled they might become. The small bed was set opposite the door, next to which sat a squat stool that would serve as a nightstand. The walls were bare wood, long since stripped of their wallpaper, the traces of which could still be seen on the rotten, termite-eaten boards. The ceiling seemed to consist entirely of a damp, spreading spot that was a melange of black, green, and dark orange. As I stepped further inside, my shoes began to catch. Looking down, I saw a forest of long, jagged splinters poking up. Trying to flatten them with my shoes as best as I could, I made my way to the bed. Dropping my luggage at the foot of the bed, I sat down on the bed and felt myself sink into it. With no small amount of hesitation, I lay back and found the bed both somehow too soft and too hard as any amount of weight caused it to sag deep down until one was inevitably laying straight on the box spring. Sitting up, I turned my attention to the rest of the room. The room's bathroom consisted of a small offset area, covered in peeling paint, floor with cracked tiles and somehow even more mildewy than the rest of the room. A small bath with dark rings around it sat low to the ground, its fixtures rusted and virtually impossible to move. I sighed and left the bathroom. I made my way across the room, my head swimming and my mood black. A good hot meal would set my soul right, I figured, and set off out for the diner. Shivering, I made my way down the cracked and uneven sidewalk to the diner. The temperature seemed to have dropped considerably since I arrived, and now my breath formed faint white wisps which soon dissipated into the dark evening. My thin jacket, though fine for a drive or a lunch meeting, was no match for this damp, persistent chill that had begun to soak into my bones, making each step a Herculean effort. It was enough that I looked forward to sleeping under the covers of that disgusting bed, as long as it meant getting out of this gloom. I silently thanked God that there was only one street, and that I remembered passing the diner on my way in, as along with the chill, a deep, dense, dark fog had descended upon Carlsberg after my arrival. If it was at all related to the fog-covered farms that I had passed during my drive, I was not sure. All I knew was that I could barely see a foot ahead of me, the dark shapes of the buildings disappearing into the gloom. Ahead, I could see the lights of the diner, shining like a dim halo, offering salvation in both food and shelter. The diner was nearly identical to any such establishment that one might see on their journey across America, like a train car dropped into the middle of town that had grown in size and bulged in shape. It was a squat, boxy building covered in rusty, indented sheet metal. A large pink neon sign proclaimed the establishment to be Patty's Diner. A thin, yellow light poured out of the stained and greasy windows, barely able to pierce the thick fog. I managed to pry the rusted door open and stepped inside. 
The smell of grease and stale coffee washed over me as I walked in. A long beige formica counter ran along the far side of the diner. All but three of the faded and torn orange upholster stools stood empty. The three occupants turned at the sound of the door swinging open. All of them had a piggish look about them. Short, stubby noses underneath beady eyes, and nestled between thick jowls. They were not heavy, not fat, just the solid sort of weight that comes when the muscles of youth turns to the fat of middle age. They wore worn and dirty farmer's clothes, flannel shirts, and pale blue overalls. And over their thin, lanky hair, they each wore a red trucker's cap. I made my way past the empty booths toward the counter, the men's eyes following me all the way. Sitting down on the stool, I attempted to give no sign that the men had succeeded in unnerving me. Not from around here, is ya? The one closest to me said, turning towards me. His voice was high and nasally. No, I said, trying to appear casual and most likely failing. Nah, the one in the middle said. Too fancy looking. What brings you to Carlsberg, stranger? The one at the end asked. I turned towards them and I saw that all three of them were staring dead at me. Their faces almost identical in their gazes and their hands all lightly touching the steak knives on the sides of their plates. Business, I said. What kind of business? The one closest to me said. Government? <laughs> no, nothing of the sort, I said, faster than intended. I'm here to do property assessments for a Mr. George Von Holden. The three of them seemed to relax, and a smile even seemed to break on their faces. Well... Mr. Von Holden is pretty well known around these parts, the middle one said. We've done a lot of work for old Von Holden over the years. Really? I asked. Uh, what sort of work, may I ask? Oh, here and there kind of work, the third one said. Farming here, handiwork there, odd jobs and that sort of thing. Oh, interesting. Sorry for the cold greeting, the first one said. A lot of undesirables come into town sometimes, and we like to keep an eye out for them. But no one with business with Mr. Von Holden is that bad, the third one said. Except maybe us. <laughs> the three laughed, and I forced a small chuckle, still unsure of what to do. We're the Schaefer brothers, by and by, the first one said. I'm Harold, he's Jim, and Fred is there at the end. The first one, or rather Harold, said, Put her there, Mr. He said, sticking a grease-covered hand out. Stevenson, I said reluctantly, taking his hand. Andrew Stevenson. You boys making trouble again. A woman's voice from behind the counter. I turned in surprise. Behind the counter stood the most normal-looking person I had seen since my arrival. Dressed in a simple pink dress underneath a stained white apron, she gave a matronly air with her gray bobbed hair and her lined but thin face. She gave a toothy grin, and it was the warmest greeting I had received in some time. Well, hello, she said. Don't get a lot of newcomers in here. Name's Lucille. She pointed at her tarnished silver name tag. More or less run the joint. Mr. This here's Mr. Andrew Stevenson, Harold interjected loudly before I could answer. Come to do some work for Mr. Von Holden. Oh, well, a friend of Mr. Von Holden is always welcome here, Lucille said, smiling even larger. What can I do for you, Mr. Stevenson? Uh, a cup of coffee to start, I said, feeling less anxious than before. And what do you recommend? The fish is on special today, she said. 
comes with a side of fried taters and slaw. Sound good? As long as it's hot, it sounds amazing, I said with a smile, which Lucille returned. <laughs> Coffee will be up in a sec, she said. Fish will be a bit. <laughs> I'm in no hurry. I said. She walked over to the coffee pot that was steaming behind the counter and poured a brown ceramic mug full before bringing it back over. Staring down into the cup, the coffee looked blacker than the night outside and somehow thicker than the fog. But the hot steam felt good on my frozen face, and I slowly raised the mug to my lips. <coughs> it took all my willpower not to spit it out. It was thick and oily, almost syrup-like, <laughs> and stronger than any coffee I'd ever had. As it made its way down my throat, I felt nauseous, and shaking, I set the cup back down. That's everyone's reaction to Lucille's coffee, Jim said with a chuckle. I reached for the nearest container of cream, dumping most of it in, followed by an unhealthy amount of sugar. I sipped it again and deemed it at least somewhat palatable. At least it was hot. The next half hour or so passed uneventfully. My three dining companions pestering me with questions, where I was from, what I did. When I mentioned Philadelphia, all their eyes went wide and Fred let out a whistle. That seemed to earn their admiration. And from then on, I was assaulted with questions about the city. Even the most trivial information seemed to thrill them. Finally, Lucille returned from the kitchen with a steaming hot plate in hand. My mouth began to drool in anticipation, the conversation having taken my attention away from the gnawing hunger in my stomach, which had returned with a vengeance. Here we go, Lucille said with that toothy smile. One fish special for our guest. As she set it down, I found part of my hunger replaced with revulsion. The fish still had its head on, which, though unnerving, was nothing I had not seen before. But the rest of it seemed wrong. It was large, far too large for any fish that would grow in streams around here. And it was pale white, like the pictures I had seen of deep sea blind fish, with dark red filmy eyes staring up at me from the plate. It was long as well, eel-like, with too many fins and strange growths at its bottom. I looked back up Lucille, who was still flashing that toothy smile, hesitantly not wanting to be rude. I picked up my fork and knife and cut a small slice off and raised it to my lips. The fish's appearance was a proper indication of what was to come next. It tasted far worse than anything I could have possibly imagined. A sick, oily taste filled my mouth, like burnt rubber covered in gasoline each chew squeezing more and more vile juice into my mouth as the chewy fish made its way slithering down my throat into my reluctant stomach. I felt tears come to my eyes as the taste somehow turned into a noxious fume, filling my nose and lungs as well as my mouth and stomach with the disgusting aquatic animal whose existence stood in defiance of the laws of nature. Still, I managed to return a small, forced smile to Lucille, who beamed in response. I know it's probably not as nice as what you're used to, she said. Being from a big city and all, but it's our specialty here. Caught fresh this morning. It's certainly different than anything I've ever eaten before, I said. Eating one of the potatoes, which at least tasted somewhat normal. I gulped down more of the vile coffee to get the taste of fish out of my mouth, and only succeeded in mixing the two disgusting flavors together. Take your time eating, Lucille said. We're open all night. I nodded in response and dove back in for another disgusting bite of the fish. Despite tasting terrible, this was likely the only place to eat in all of Carlsberg, and it wouldn't do to upset Lucille. 
The men left me to my meal and began to talk amongst themselves in hushed tones, occasionally looking over at me. I heard little of what they said, focusing all my attention on keeping the contents of my stomach in my stomach, but heard enough to glean the nature of their conversation. They were discussing something Mr. Von Holden would need done. I thought nothing of it. After I finished my meal, I said goodnight to my companions and to Lucille, who offered an open invitation to come back any time. Pulling my jacket close to me, I braced for the chill of the night. The cold knocked any warmth the food and coffee had filled me with in the first few seconds being outside. During my time in the diner, the air had grown even colder, though it looked as if the fog had cleared somewhat and I could now make out the shapes of distant trees and buildings as I made my way back to the hotel. Despite my resolve to keep going, a shadow of movement in the distance caught my eye. Slowly turning my head towards it, I stumbled back against the nearest building, all thoughts of the cold leaving me. In the distance stood a solitary tree, twisted and gnarled, rising out of a small patch of damp brown earth next to the grocers. Underneath was a hooded figure, whose form I could barely make out through the gloom. I saw it raise a hand, thin, almost skeletal, tipped with bleeding fingers, towards me and it slowly began to drift closer and closer in an unnatural motion. Turning, I ran down the street, past alleys filled with overflowing garbage cans and shifting shadows, stepping in puddles of the foulest liquids all to get away from that figure. In the distance, I saw the lights of the hotel window spilling their sickly, thin yellow light onto the street, and I picked up my pace, not even risking to turn my head to see if my pursuer had followed me. I struggled to open the door, but it was locked. I hammered the door with all my might, yelling for help, but received no answer. All I heard was a low shuffling behind me. Turning around, I saw the original hooded figure had been joined by several others of various heights and widths, but all were dressed in the same black robes. They were several yards away now, filling the width of the street. I abandoned the door and sprinted to the parking lot. Fumbling, I managed to unlock my car. Slamming the door shut, I turned the key in the ignition. Nothing. Not even a whimper from the engine. I tried again, and still nothing. I tried one more time, and when the car refused to start, I gave up and climbed out of the passenger side door. I scanned the horizon past the parking lot, but could see nothing through the fog. I heard the same low shuffling as before, and I knew that the hooded figures were getting closer. Without thinking of a plan, I ran out of the parking lot, away from the town, and into the deep fog. I ran for what felt like hours. From the deep furrows in the ground, I assumed I had entered a field of some kind. The ground was muddy and several times almost succeeded in sucking my shoes off my feet. I had no idea what to do next. I was consumed with an all-encompassing desire to run from the hooded figures. Several times I turned around and saw nothing. As soon as I would stop to catch my breath, however, I would see one of them appearing out of the fog, their terrible skeletal hands raised, pointing at me. So I would run again. After an eternity of this, I managed to stumble onto an old dirt road. Despite not knowing where it would lead, I assumed that it might lead towards civilization and hopefully help. As I ran down the old dirt road, I saw a farmhouse appear in the distance, lights shining through the dark gloom. Even from my distance and despite the fog, I could see that it was an old building, older than any of the buildings in Carlsberg proper. It rose three stories off the ground, a mansion in the mind of its builders, with large bay windows and turrets in the Victorian fashion. Around the first story ran a fenced porch with the odd chair and table set on it. The house's whitewash was faded and peeling, revealing old gray wood and rusted pipes snaking up and down the facade. 
The windows, which were still intact, were dirty and partially covered by broken shutters. The rest were broken and were either boarded up or covered by damp cardboard. An old barn stood about a hundred yards away from the house in a similar condition. Only a few traces of the red paint remained and the roof was partially caved in. In front, a rusted pickup truck sat next to an old brown sedan. I ran past the cars and up the steps to the front door. The porch steps squeaked and creaked with every footfall, and my nose was assaulted with the smell of rotting wood and animal dung. I gave the old whitewashed door a few sharp knocks. A few minutes later, I heard the sound of footsteps and the door swung back. He was the tallest man I had ever seen, his bald head scraping the top of the door frame as he stepped through it. His salt and pepper hair was neatly trimmed and he had a well-groomed beard on his long, drooping face. Deep blue eyes peered out from under bushy black eyebrows and they seemed to shine with purpose. He was well-dressed in a clean but worn gingham shirt and brown corduroy pants and simple work boots. On his one bony, thin hand, he wore an old, gold-class ring set with a bright green stone. May I help you? He said in a deep, polite tone. Yes, I said, standing up straight. My name is Andrew Stevenson from the Kevin Prado Real Estate Agency. You need to help me. I gasped, trying to breathe. There's... There's a gang chasing me. Well, calm down, son, he said, breaking into a warm smile. I'd be happy to take you in, and maybe we can figure out what's happening. He gestured me in and followed soon after. I was happy to hear the door lock behind me. Despite the dilapidated exterior of the farmhouse, the interior retained a cozy country sensibility. Old worn carpets covered the polished wooden floors, and old solid oak and maple furniture was dusted and covered in the collected antiques of generations of farmers. Portraits of men and women bearing a slight resemblance to my host stared down from the wallpapered walls, and I deduced that they must have been relatives or ancestors of the current owner. My host led me to the kitchen, which was simple, but warm, with tiled floors, an old wood-burning stove, and a large table in the middle. Have a seat, he said, pulling out a chair. I slumped down, happy to rest my legs and catch my breath. Water? Please, I managed in between breaths. He brought over a tall glass of clear water and I drank it down in several gulps. Pulling up his own chair, he sat opposite me and leaned forward on his elbows. His eyes seemed to bore into mine and I felt myself strangely relaxed in his presence. So, why don't you tell me what's going on, he said. And so I told him who I was, why I was here, and what had happened. The whole time he said nothing, simply nodding his head or rubbing his mouth. Finally, when my tale was finished, he spoke. Well, I'm... Afraid I'm the reason for all your misfortune, friend, he said. I felt the blood drain from my face. What do you mean? Why, I'm George Von Holden, he said with a short laugh. I'm the one that had your agency send you all the way out here. Never expected anything like this to happen, though. I laughed in relief. What providence had brought me here to the home of my client? He laughed with me. Don't worry, Mr. Stevenson. You're safe as long as you're under my roof, he said. You can stay here tonight. We'll go into town tomorrow, talk to the sheriff, and get this whole thing sorted out. Then we can get on to business. How's that sound? (laughs) It is music to my ears, sir, I said. Finally, for the first time since this terrible ordeal had begun, I felt safe. Mr. Von Holden led me out of the kitchen and into the parlor we had passed. Flicking on one of the lights, he began to make up one of the sofas into a makeshift bed. 
I offer you a bed, he said, but sadly the upstairs is in no shape to receive guests. Pity, he said, his eyes distant. You should have seen this place in its prime. Well, all of Carlsberg in its prime. Those times will come again soon, I hope. He turned to me. Sorry, forgive the ramblings of an old farmer. Will this do? Of course, sir, I said. My eyes wandered to the front door. The image of the figures was still sharp in my mind. Mr. Von Holden must have seen my face and put a comforting hand on my shoulder. Don't worry, he said. The doors here are sturdy. Nothing and no one gets in here unless I want it to. He started for the stairs. If you'll excuse me, it's past my bedtime. Bathroom's down the hall if you need it. He turned around. See you in the morning. And with that, he disappeared up the stairs. Turning off the light, I made my way back to the sofa. Collapsing on it, I soon fell asleep. I awoke some time later to a loud bang. I shot up from the sofa and swiveled my head around disoriented. My legs and lungs ached from my flight and I groaned as I stood up. Three loud bangs echoed down the hall, outside the parlor. Limping, I made my way out of the room and down the hall. Three more loud bangs echoed down the dark hall. Feeling along the wall, I struggled to find a light switch, and finding none, slowly made my way to the source of the noise. Three more bangs. I reached the end of the hallway, standing in front of an old, sturdy door. Three bangs came from behind it. I considered getting my host, but I did not wish to disturb him. It was most likely the basement and the banging was some old water heater or boiler of some kind. I did not wish to trouble Mr. Von Holden any more than I had, and especially over something as trivial as my fear of a boiler. Stealing myself nonetheless, I opened the door with a squeak and made my way down the steps behind it. I must have been in a cellar or basement of some kind. The room was pitch black and the floor must have been dirt. I stumbled around hoping to find a light switch or candle of some kind. Eventually I found a wall. It too was made of dirt. I heard the three bangs again, but they were distant this time. I don't know what possessed me to try and discover the source of this banging, but I made my way along the wall towards it. I followed the wall for some time, and at some point I had left the house behind me. Thick and knotted roots ran along the walls, and moisture dripped from above. Still, I made my way through the dark, towards the ever-distant banging. After a while, I don't know how long, I saw a dim light off in the distance. I ran towards it, hoping to finally get out of the ever-present dark. The closer I came, the closer the banging sounded. I was almost there. Finally, I reached the light. I entered a small, low cavern. Long roots hung down from the ceiling and twining with each other, forming a lattice overhead. A tangle of them ran down the far wall, and at the bottom of them sat a squat, stone altar. Candles were set all along the rim of the cavern, casting dim, flickering light and deep shadows against the cavern walls. I made my way down the small slope, towards the floor of the cavern, watching not to trip on the numerous roots that had made their way up through the dirt floor. Sniffing, I smelled the sweet scent of decay and rot, mixed with fertilizer, overripe fruit, and mildew. It was the same scent I had smelled in the hotel, all over town, in fact, that same dirty, rotten smell, but it was much, much stronger here. 
My head swam in the scent, light and swirling, and I lost my balance, falling to the ground. I heard the three loud bangs behind me again, and I turned my head slowly. Behind me stood one of the cloaked figures, its skeletal fingers grasping a small hand drum. Its hand banged three more times on the drum, and from the shadows of the cavern, more of the cloaked figures returned. I scrambled back on my hands and feet, only to find myself at the base of the altar. One of the figures grabbed me, and despite my best efforts, wrapped roots from the tangle around my arms, tying them into place. The figure shoved me face down on the altar, and I felt a sharp pain in my arms. Looking down, I felt my stomach churn at the sight. The roots had begun to burrow into my arms, digging their way through my flesh and muscle until they stopped at the bone. Then, slowly, they cracked through that, and I screamed as I felt my bones break. The roots slowly made their way up my arms, digging, tearing through my arms. I screamed and pulled, trying to get away, but the roots were too strong. Finally, exhausted, I collapsed forward on the altar. The roots were no longer burrowing. I tried to breathe and could only manage a thin gasp. My chest was heavy, and my pulse was slowing. The roots were in my heart. Blood of the outsider will water the crops. I heard a low voice from behind me, a voice I had heard before. Weakly, I managed to turn my head. The figure behind me threw back his cloak, and I stared into the eyes of George von Holden. Behind him, I saw the others throw back their hoods as well. I recognized a few, the Schaefer brothers and Lucille in the front, with the immense bill behind them, all grinning wide, terrible smiles. Flesh of the outsider will nourish the soil, he said, looking at me as one would look at a pile of filth. Life of the outsider will restore life in our town, he said, turning away. I tried to scream, but felt no breath in my lungs. I wheezed, trying to breathe, but found it impossible. I tried to pull, but had no strength. I felt the cool stone of the altar against my cheek as my vision went black. The last thing I heard before my eyes shut forever was Good Harvest. Thanks for listening. Please excuse any sounds of chainsaws you may hear. It isn't my torture dungeon this time. The city has been cutting down three gigantic trees in my neighborhood for the whole week. Because you know what Los Angeles needs? Less trees. They soak up all the good smoggy air and they provide way too much shade. It's disgusting. Please don't send me angry emails. I actually love trees. Please do what you can to help the currently burning Amazon rainforest. I know it feels like we're not equipped to help, but I will put a link in the show notes to an article about nine ways you can help the rainforest. Now, to Patreon shoutouts, my loving thanks to my newest patrons, Maggie Tellier, Amanda Pride, Sarah Brock, Cass Jordan, Alberto, and Panda Burr, (laughs) sending you all love and light and a big ghost hug. 
Remember, by using my offer codes for my sponsors, you support the show in a big way and keeps me being able to do the show weekly. Thank you to Native for so graciously sponsoring this week's episode. Rating and reviewing on Apple Podcasts also helps. If you want to be a part of the Scary to Sleep community, you can follow the show on Reddit, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and Tumblr. I don't have a presence on the dark web yet. Sorry. To submit a story to be considered for the show, please email it to scarytosleep at gmail.com. I think that's all for now. Now, go get some sleep. Sweet dreams. <laughs>